Hello, boys and girls, no matter where in the world you might be. Welcome to the Highbury Squad. It's a brand new series. It's Football Frenemies, and we have a frenemy in town. And you may have recognized this guy on this pick, but we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Here we roll. <laughs> Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Hello, boys and girls. No matter where in the world you might be, welcome back to the Highbury Squad. I hope you are all enjoying your summer so far and it is being good to you. Welcome to a brand new series. As I promised, we'll be doing lots of pre-records as well during the summer. And I've been looking forward to this tasty little number because we all have them in our lives. Football frenemies. People you really like, but you don't necessarily love the team that they support, but somehow, some way, you find a way to get along. I'm really happy to have this fella back. I don't know if you guys remember, about a year ago, we did a football money show, and um, Mr. Pete Redding came on and chatted with us. Welcome to the show, Geordie Pete Redding. Thank you I for wonder such who a... you support. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I wonder. Thank you for such a great intro. It's lovely to see you and lovely to be back. It's uh, awesome to have you back. Now, I put up a picture that some of our folks may have found confusing. They're like, hold on a second. Super Kev isn't a Geordie, but what's this all about? <laughs> so before we get stuck into a little bit of football frenemy chat, mm -hmm. why don't you explain to the good folks at home what this little number is all about, Pete? Yeah, sure. So um, I started Hollywood Balls about two years ago. It was an audio podcast and uh, Kev, Super Kev and I have been friends for many years and he, more than often than not, he would come on and guest for us. Um, and then it sort of it escalated into into a show, uh, a video show um, similar to this. And Kev and I have, have gone through having a host of. So it, it, and it, I have to say it wasn't necessarily anything to do with Newcastle or Arsenal. It was football in general. Um, and it still is. So it emerged and Soccer Saturday, our, our very own version, uh, was born with Kev. And we have a host of other guests on um, from all around the, the globe, not just footballers, but musicians, TV stars. Um, and it, it went from there and it, it gained great popularity. Uh, everything was going really well. Um, we just uh, we happened to decide on, the t you know, a few a few issues on on the social media front with with the likes of data access and and you know what we were doing with 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 previous forums with the crypto forum and doing our own show in there and we just thought that hollywood balls deserved its own platform so we made one <laughs> so we we made a cross between a between a, a netflix a, a, and a youtube style so it's um it, it's our very own hollywood balls live platform and again it has lots of different content in there football shows um, lifestyle uh, but predominantly football um it's early days and it's it's just been born in the last two or three months but it's exciting times and it's a little bit of a game changer when it comes to fan engagement i have to say yeah well it's up to you how much you want to share. Um, maybe we can get sure. back uh, to that as well uh, at the end of the show as well. Um, once folks get to know a little bit more about you and, and your background. Last time you were on, we were talking about um, football finance and stuff. And it's interesting in terms of your platform, what you're talking about, Pete, and where you're going. Because, you know, fan engagement, fan participation, uh, football's always been about the fans and yep. um, I'm loving what you're doing. And maybe towards the end of the show, we can tap back into it and you can let people Happy know to. where they can find the platform and stuff. This is episode one of Football Frenemies. It's Arsenal versus Newcastle this Monday, June 13th. This show will be going out to you in the next couple of days. Uh, we're recording it this fine Monday uh, here at Highbury Squad Central. Uh, no football to talk about. I don't know how your weekends are going, Pete, real quick, but are you bored already? 
<laughs> really am yeah searching searching the you know the, the vaults to see what's on um anything's doing at the moment but it just you can say what you like you know i know there's there's nations league or whatever it is but it just doesn't cut it does it no no it really doesn't and i think for you and me in terms of our generation i've always loved international football i really love the world cup i love the euros but a little bit like our domestic game too many games sometimes dilute the end product and I think, you know, f- from these Nations League games, you can see some of these players are absolutely, completely knackered and the quality yep. just isn't isn't there. Um, right, so we'll get back to Hollywood balls in just a little bit. For now, let's get stuck into the good stuff. Football frenemies. Now, you have been a Geordie your entire, entire life. Your team has gone through some roller coaster rides. I always say as Arsenal fans, my goodness, how lucky we have been Never to have been relegated, although we did get a little bit close to flirting with some danger um, at the beginning of this season. We turned that narrative around, didn't turn it around the way we wanted in the end. But I always say when I watch the Premier League, the championship, anything um, that gets, you know, that to that point of the season where your team is fighting for relegation. I want to start there a little bit before I get to the new money because... Yeah. We are spoiled. And sometimes I feel like, do we complain too much? Is it because we've experienced so much, Pete? You know, going invincible, winning trophies, getting to Euro- Euro- European um, final uh, in, in the Champions League, winning it with Super Kev back in the day, haven't won it since then. And then there's teams like Newcastle. You're not, you know, you're not the Norwich and Watfords that go bing, bong, bing, bong, but you have had and have been on a roller coaster over the last few years. Talk me through that a little bit. Absolutely. And, and I have to say that first and foremost, when when you talk about what you're saying, that there's a standard at, at clubs like Arsenal. Uh, and, and and that standard comes over in the fans and, and, and their passion. So first and foremost, you know, everyone has an opinion and it's never wrong. Um, and Arsenal should be up there. I think for Newcastle, it was for the first time. I've been going since I was five years old. So, you know, um, I'm 40, 47 now. Uh, never seen us win anything. There you go. To put that into perspective, in and I've been going as I say forty years, home and away. Never seen them win anything apart from the odd first division championship. Um, so yeah, and then this season was just probably low. It, it, it has to take some doing that when Newcastle is your be all and end all that you're not looking forward to a season that you just actually dread Saturdays coming around because of the style of football, who was in charge of your team. And you're basically hurtling, um, Sophie, all the way to relegation. Mm. There's no other word for it. And in a, in a manner that is, and I know it becomes a cliche and lots of other fans go, oh, they always say there's 50, 50 odd thousand there, but there is, you, you can't get away from that. And I just think that at the start of this season, all the way through until the takeover happens, I was prepared. And that there was no way that team under that under that management was going to survive. No way. I was always really scared about playing you. And some people come at me in the chat, fine, um, in the comments. Uh, but it was the game that I feared the most. And Super Kev will tell you that when it came to predicting our last five games of the season, I predicted a loss against Newcastle. And I never like doing that because I don't want to be seen as a negative Nelly, but I, I, yes. I have to be honest and true to myself and share those thoughts with, you know, the folks who listen to the show. It felt to me that, you know, Bruno Gamares had a point to prove that he's got a beef with us. We've got a beef with him. Um, but, I will say this, if there's one man that changed your season, it's Eddie Howe. And talk about a manager for the perfect moment and the perfect time. Everton fans probably kicking themselves, not picking him up, although Frank Lampard did save the Toffees from relegation in the end. But your your January transfer window, and here's the frenemy part, I was actually jealous that you got a player like Gamaraj. And I'm like, why would a player like him want to join a team that's probably going to get relegated? Everyone at the time was thinking Newcastle were doomed. Um, yeah. You then, you get Trippier, who yes, got injured, but for the first few games, my goodness, the leadership he brought to the team and the energy 
and the change. And then you got Chris Woods up front. Chris, it's Chris, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Up, up front. Because I was thinking, I always think of the old goalkeeper as well. Um, up front, who, albeit didn't maybe have the same impact, but he did in terms of presence and options. And then Eddie Howe, you know, starts playing Joe Ellington in midfield. And your the trajectory of your season completely changes. And Tottenham did similarly. Uh, they they bought in the two to the two players from Juventus, and we stuck to our guns and our plan. Now I'm sure you had a plan in the summer, but you you had to throw the kitchen sink at survival. I was hoping we would throw the kitchen sink at the Champions League. Mm. Let's talk about January a little bit and what Newcastle fans think of that whole time and if that was the moment. Yeah, there was a moment. It's funny. We, we we talked on we have a we have a Newcastle podcast as well for for Arab News called Black and White with Arab News, and we have different ex players from Newcastle on there. So we've had we've had Lee Clark, we've had John Beresford, Barry Venison, some big names, Shaka Hislop, all coming on. And what we've done throughout the the thirty episodes is it, it's it's charted a journey. At the beginning of the podcast, it was doom and gloom, of course, and what we what we needed to do. As that pod, podcast progressed and we got to January, there was there was hope. But the biggest turning point was, I think that if I can go back to Kevin Keegan being a manager, and he sold a dream to people at that time that that, new, that to come to Newcastle, your Rob Lees, your Andy Coles, and it's a similar scenario with Eddie Howe. I think that he had to sell that dream to Bruno Guimaraes and to Kieran Trippier and say, listen, guys, if we get through, if we can stay up, and it's a big ask, by the way, because it's never been done before, uh, you know, um, where they were. If we can, something special is going to happen. And I think that's what he did. He sold the dream. And mm. what he did was he brought players. Not, people say about that transfer window, and I, I have to say, yes, of course, I, brilliant additions. But, you know, not splashing cash madly in today's market, I have to say. Matt Target on loan from Aston Villa. Dan Byrne from Brighton. You know, mm. yeah, Gamarish was a statement signing, as was Trippier. The others, the, it was the other players that came. You said Joe Linton. Um, he's, he's he's a reform. He's, he's our player of the season this year, that'll tell you. And I think he created a togetherness and they went on a run. And it was more that than the new, than the new players. They played as a team. And the turning point was a trip to Saudi Arabia, which which gained massive negative connotations in the press. But when they're your owners, that's what's going to happen. You're going to go there. And it was a warm winter training camp off the back of a win at Elland Road. And that was the turning point for me. So mm. the, the win at Elland Road, because the trajectory of both clubs, Leeds and Newcastle, changed. And we passed Leeds. And we went on that incredible nine-game run, which virtually... Um, sealed our our safety, but it was that time in in January with that togetherness, just little things that I haven't seen in a long time, if ever. You know, players wanting to take photos in the changing room after the game, just with a certain, and it, it was hashtag win. And at first, the opposition fans were saying, "Oh, look at them! You'd think they'd won the Champions League." Well, it felt like it. I have to say, it felt like it. And every game that we won and every stride that we took closer to safety was 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 was, a, it was an amazing uh, half season to, to get that done. But I have to say that it did prove that we were going nowhere under under what was happening beforehand. So it was Eddie Howe and a, and a togetherness. And he got players playing who weren't playing previously. Yeah, it's uh, it's true. I think there's some similarities, and I do want to get to the owners and the ownership in just a second here, but just to kind of riff off what you're saying too, it feels like there's this transition happening in football, and of course it's cyclical, and you know, it feels like it's a younger manager's game now. Um, yeah. You know, you know, it's so funny. Pep and Jurgen, although still young, seem so much older than you know, the Artetas and the Eddie Howes and the Lampards and the Gerrards of the world, of course. Um, similarly to you, Arteta came in and, yeah, he's he won the FA Cup. Some fans would argue that he won that FA Cup with, you know, Emery's uh, team. And since he's failed in the FA Cup miserably over the last two seasons, got us kicked out of Europe, finished eighth and eighth. But this season, I don't think 
we can argue with, okay, if you get us kicked out of Europe, you got us back into Europe, we finished fifth, we whiffed on finishing in the Champions League. When you when you look at the game when you beat us too, um, it was just I hate when people say, Oh, Arsenal was so bad. You know, say, yeah, same when I'm glad Brentford you said beat, that. <laughs> yeah, when uh, Brentford beat Chelsea uh, and Crystal Palace beat us. It's always like, you know, the bigger club. Oh, they were so bad. But mm. you were so good that day. I mean, you absolutely schooled us completely. And I, I wanted your take on the two managers and not necessarily who you think will have the better career. But I think what we're seeing is I don't like this talk about, even though it's Newcastle, like bring in Mourinho, bring in this big manager, bring in this, this, just because you're a club now with tons of money. Talk me through the the younger manager vibe and I'd love to know, you know, your take on Arteta as well and and the manager you I, guys have inherited, luckily. I'll start I'll start with Eddie Howe because at the end of the day, I, I know I speak for quite a few fans, not all of them, but I, I think the majority would say if Newcastle were to win something for the first time in a very long time. I would hope it was Eddie Howe that did that mm. because it, he will always have a special place, whatever happens. When I see Jose Mourinho's name linked, I just think, oh, no, not for me. Uh, you, you you just hit on that there that, you know, it's a young, it's a young manager's game now. You know, you, you're talking about Jose Mourinho who for me, uh, there's, there's no doubt in what he's done. It's fantastic, but, no, not for me. I think that Eddie Howe is is the way forward. It might be a transition, and and it might be that the new owners look at something that um, I think. It, I mean, he's just signed an extension to his contract, which obviously doesn't mean anything in today's game. But I think they will give him that that time to see to see how Newcastle um, how they improve, where they finish. I mean, next season is going to be absolutely key to to the plans of, of of the owners and what they do. But for me, it's got to be Eddie Howe. And, and you come back to Arteta, and I think that there's a manager that I know he divides opinion uh, amongst the Arsenal fans. I, I see it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter all of the time, and I see it's he, he divides opinion. It's intense. But this is the scrutiny that, that I said of, of a top club like yourselves. I think that he's done an incredible job. And I think... Funnily enough, I was speaking. Um, I was speaking with Carlton Palmer this morning, and he mentioned him in an interview. That, uh, and Carlton said, "You know, you have to look at teams that give managers time." He said, "Look at, uh, look at Arteta." He said, three years or so, um, he's starting to turn it around." He said, "Look at Moyes at Man United. Was wasn't given the time." He said, "Wasn't given any uh, support." He said, "Look at him now at West Ham." He said, "He's flourishing." So, I think that when you look at the likes of Arteta and and I'll ask you this. So if if Arteta goes, who comes in and, and how long does he have? Right. No, and it's a you great know. question. And I wasn't I, – I've, I've been so critical of him in, in the eighth and eighth seasons and getting dumped out of the FA Cup two seasons in a row and getting kicked out of Europe and starting the league, you know, um, three games, zero goals scored, zero points. And I believe that – Sensible Arsenal fans who don't come at it from a vitriolic, you know, abuse um, angle, who are giving constructive criticism about why they feel like, you know, you, there are red flags and one should be very cautious. But like you say, and Kev's always said about players, and we've always argued about players versus the manager. And I think it's not just down to the players. The manager is accountable at the end of the day. You know, he's lauded when we win. Um, but yet it's the players' fault when we lose. And now when you look at the landscape, unless you're going to go get Pep or Klopp, you know, it's it, there's – who else is there? Ten Hag is unproven in the Premier League. Absolutely. And my, my good friend Tom Canton from Guna Talk TV, we, we had this conversation about Ten Hag, and he was saying how this is a manager who's used to going into – and has had a complete system built around him from the academy to the structure of the club, the way they conduct their business, um, the strength of the hierarchy. Um, Ajax is a machine and he's now going into completely broken system, still the biggest club in the world. Yes. Alongside Barcelona and Real Madrid, but completely fractured inside. So 
Ten Hag is going to struggle for a little bit, I'm sure. You know, Manchester United have put band-aids over their problems. Um, yeah. And you and you and you you could say were they better off keeping Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for that continuity? Did they really benefit from bringing in Ralph Ragnick? You know, in the end, no, they didn't. They actually regressed. Ole finished second. He did. And so I, I see your point there with regards to Arteta because a lot of Arsenal fans were like, well, we want Antonio Conte or we want Ten Hag. And I do believe there are talented managers out there. Um, but now when you look at the pool of managers, it's kind of, for me, better the devil you know than the be- the devil you don't. Um, look, I would have loved Antonio Conte at our club, but you also have to look at culture. Um we are not that type of club. And I, I don't know what you feel about that because I'm not a huge fan of, well, that's not the Ars- – the, what is the Arsenal way? We've lost our way. So we're building a new way, a mm. new DNA, a new profile. But I don't think you can deny that Conte still has it. I agree with you on Mourinho. It's a lot of trouble. Conte is not exactly the easiest. So for me, I think it's going to be exciting next season as you look at Lampard – his evolution, Gerard, his evolution, Arteta, Eddie Howe. I, I, I think that's pretty exciting for the Premier League. I agree. And I have to say, just, just going on to Conte, it, I, I can see why he's not Arsenal. He is, he, he is Spurs to me. And from a, you know, from a, from a Northern view, looking in on, on North London, he is Spurs, you know, he, he jumps up and down. He wants money. Um, he needs to shape a team with players who are already established. I love what Arteta's doing when I see Saka, when I see these young players, and when when they play well and when they click, boy, do they click. And what, like I say, and I've said this to Kev, you know, look at look at Tottenham and look at Arsenal. Arsenal have years ahead of them with the team that he's building currently, you know, and 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 Spurs don't have that. I mean, how how old's Harry Kane? I mean, you know, this be probably his 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 last World Cup, definitely. Uh, you look at they're just they're ready made, and that's how Conte seems to operate. I'm loving, I'm loving the fact that uh, those youngsters there, you know, Erdegaard, and he's building a team. And yes, it's going to take little time, but we know football fans have no patience whatsoever. Even I'll give you an example, Sophie. Even Newcastle were they'd won five or six uh, games. Oh, they'd gone seven unbeaten and they were coming to a game whereby uh, one of the, uh, Chris Wood was injured, so they he, they couldn't play. And so he had to revert to Joe Linton going back up front. And we all know that was where he failed. Mm-hmm. And the Newcastle fans on Twitter, oh my word, just moaning, oh, what's Eddie Howe doing? What's he playing? Well, what's he doing? Well, funnily enough, that was a, it was a game against Brentford uh, away from home and Joe Linton scored too, um, as it happens. So, you know, fans are, they're, they're quick to jump, but when it comes to it, and, and I look at Arsenal and Spurs, I know I know who I would prefer as, as my manager. So let's talk about the money a little bit. Um, I I have, a, you know, I, we did a show once, the, the takeover happened, and of course, Newcastle fans have been long-suffering fans, and they f- they fill that stadium regardless of who's manager, you know, who the owner is. Um, they're passionate, and if I can just say this with respect, I also think though they're a fan base that are a little bit more elevated in their opinion of where they should be based on where they've been. Right. So this shows football frenemies, and I understand why Arsenal fans lose their minds because. You know, like we said at the top of the show, when you've been used to winning, it's very, once you've stayed at the Four Seasons, it's really, it's really tough to stay at the Roadside Motel. Uh, and I mm. do, I believe that that comes from the Keegan era, the David Ginola, the Aspria, you know, the Philip Albert fifth goal in the rain. I don't know if it was the fifth goal, the 5 0 drubbing of Manchester yep. United. It comes from that era, getting, of course, to an FA Cup final, but losing. Um, you know, Alan Shearer, those the, the, that time, not building enough on that, but having a Les Ferdinand and a great partnership. Now we find ourselves in a situation where Newcastle may just well be able to deliver on some type of silverware. I think the pressure is mm. going to be on next season, which might not be fair based on the ownership having to deliver immediately, because I don't, I don't know 
why, but I don't feel like you're going to go insane on the cash this summer. Can you talk me through the moral part firstly? Because I, I, I definitely, in terms of like, like my life and everything, there's issues everywhere with ownership and what people believe and don't. Um, Manchester City, you know, people have issues there. PSG, people have issues there. Listen, you could have issues with Stan Kroenke and how his wife makes products for Walmart. There's issues with all top brands everywhere. Let's get to the ownership part first and how you feel about the Saudi Arabian group coming in and being part of Newcastle United? Look, it's a question that always gets asked. And and I think that, I, I think I said this before, Eddie Howe did as well, you know, for him to be asked that question from journalists, how he feels about that. I don't think that any, any, any normal human can, can condone what goes on. Uh, and I say that in uh, Saudi Arabia, but I also say that to people and certain writers, certain certain extremely talented journalists who write for big newspapers that get carried away with this as well. But, you know, who, who, who slammed Newcastle fans for lauding it? Let me just say they're happy for their football team, you know, and, 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 and that has to be separated. You know, we, we, we said it when the show when the show was on just after the takeover um and i made i made, I made a pack with super kev we said look we're a football show and that's what we're going to talk about mm-hmm. you know i'm not here to comment on 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 human rights i'm not an expert and if it's good enough for boris johnson and and, and his government to not comment on it it's good enough for eddie howe and, and me not to so you know i do keep it football but i will say for those people that feel um you know, then there's a there's a large there's a large quantity of it. Is it all to do with that, or is some of it? Some of it is jealousy. Um, it has to be. I've spoken to Manchester City fans who said, "Be prepared, be prepared for utter hatred coming your way, uh, green-eyed monster." And what I will say is that, you know, I live in the Middle East, so um, I'm based in the UAE, and there's a major tournament happening not far from me that everyone. Is, is still going to be attending, still going to, all the media are going to. Um, you know, there's there's golf taking place in Saudi Arabia. The F1's there now. Uh, but Joshua's going back to box. It doesn't get the same. It doesn't get the same um, coverage that Newcastle United's mm. takeover does. Now, I'm not condoning anything. Uh, as I say, I'm here to talk about football. But I think that um, it, it, it needs to be looked at. It needs to be managed. And I think it's an easy narrative. For for and, and and I would say unfortunately Paul Merson, uh, Simon Jordan have all fallen into that trap. It's an easy narrative to say that Newcastle bought their way to safety. I don't think they did. I don't think they did. I think they spent well, uh, and I think they spent the equivalent of what today's market is, and um, with a couple of reasonable additions. Dan Byrne didn't break the bank. Matt Target didn't break the bank, and someone of 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 Bruno's class. Come going forward, I think he's a snip. So I'd be interested to see what happens next season. I don't think there'll be wholesale changes. I think he's got a squad there and I think he'll add to it. I think there'll be a few come in and I don't think there'll be many leaving because I think he needs to build a squad. So as you say, it is it is pivotal next year, uh, but I don't think they'll go mad. No, no, no way. Do you, do you think in terms of splashing the cash, do you think that they're cognizant of that because you know city when they came in they the bravado of the spending was just like you know they were blowing everyone out the market and of course that changed not city just kind of you know took the baton from abramovich uh, and chelsea so i would even go back and say jack walker is the one that changed mm. money in football um in the blackburn rover Bro- rovers years who are you who can you see coming in? Can you not see, do you not feel like after everything that you've been through and with the new owners that you need that signature signing, like to build on Bruno? Can you see that happening this summer? No, I can see, I can see Eddie looking at, and he said it three times and be lucky enough to attend a couple of his press conferences as well. And he has a, he has a key rhetoric and it's like-minded characters that's what he's getting at. 
and he's getting it. I know there was an opportunity to sign a couple of Premier League players that went elsewhere. Uh, some went um, to Everton, some went to Aston Villa. Um, and they were first choice at Newcastle. Didn't want them. Didn't want the attitude that they brought. So I can't see that statement signing happen, happening yet. I also know that they were looking very closely at the Manchester City journey. And that's something that has been very, very carefully noted uh, in, mm. in KSA. Because you look at that, you mentioned it, going out, splashing cash, but it didn't work. Didn't work first time around. Rubinho, um, signings like that, statement signings. No, I can see careful additions. And, and what I do feel is that it will be it will be people of the ilk of Bruno Guimaraes, um, that uh, there may be one or two surprising or, or one statement signing, uh, you know, that, that is, that's a great name. It's always a possibility, but I think on the whole, it'll be careful. Another narrative that I think is quite lazy is, you know, it's very easy to put clickbait um, questions out there. The media does it a lot. Who will have the better season next year? Newcastle, or Arsenal. Uh, I did a show with Jim Piddock, who's a Crystal Palace fan. Um, and because Patrick Vieira is the manager, you know, there's always that question of, well, who will have a better season next year, Vieira or Mikel Arteta? And I, I, unfortunately, the influx of money immediately makes people feel that brings like success, you know, right away. Manchester City and I hope people accept this the way I'm saying it. They're a smaller club than Arsenal. They're just doing much, much bigger things. And they're becoming a much bigger club. Fan base wise, you get more people at your stadium than you wouldn't be able to get a ticket in Newcastle if you were in the Champions League. You can get a ticket at the you Etihad. You wouldn't get in the city centre. You wouldn't get in the city centre. But So it comes with this expectation and this stress. So how... What are the expectations for next season? And do you now see yourselves, and do you agree with that narrative, you'll be challenging Arsenal, you'll be challenging Tottenham, you know, you'll be up there with the, the way Manchester United is broken and, and West Ham being where they're at? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think that if you look at it sensibly, Manchester City and Liverpool are the two best teams in the Premier League, and that will remain next season for, for me. That'll be the top two. I then move down. I think that Chelsea have new owners. They're going to have money to spend. Uh, Arsenal are going to have to spend some money, and I think they will. I think they'll make a statement. So there's four straight off. You've got Manchester United, and as poor as they were, they still finished in the top echelons. So Manchester United are on a rebuild massively. I think if Newcastle were to to push and, and try and push on, I think they would look around the next group of teams, your Leicester Cities, who tailed away towards the end of last season. Um, and I think West Ham, I think Declan Rice will leave. I think, I think Rice will go and I think that'll leave a huge hole at West Ham. Can they repeat what they did again or will they be mid-table-ish? So I think that as, as far as I'm concerned, the top four, top five will, will take care of itself. And I could see Newcastle in and around that sort of seventh, eighth spot. That's that's what I would like to see, possibly a good cup run. And that's whereby, again, the squad comes into it. And people say, no, you can get rid of him. And uh, names that were, names that would have been welcomed. So under, mm -hmm. the, you know, at the start of the season, you're people praying for a change. that they're now, they're now not good enough because of who, who the owners are. No, that's that's not correct. I think, I think steady, I think steady uh, wins wins the day for Newcastle, and I think that's what'll happen uh, from from what I hear. And I think that um, if if we were to finish in the top eight around that, I'd be I'd be absolutely I'd be ecstatic because it's it's another it's another year of build. A couple of our players that have been attached to your club, um, one more recently than the other. Uh, Rob Holding was one a few months ago, um, last last year too. And the most recent, which, you know, I feel is just a perfect example of the rumor mill. However, if <laughs> you really wanted to buy Kieran Tierney for 50 million, I would take that. And some Arsenal fans agree with that, some don't. I, I've, I feel that you can't rely on him for a season and he's proven to, you know, when he does get injured, he stays out for quite a bit of time, Pete. 
Mm. When you look at our team and those two plays in particular, but also, you know, with the show is football frenemies, although this then there's no frenemies there, but someone like Harry Winks, who's who seems to be up for grabs. What what's your take on that ilk of player holding Tierney? Is there any truth to you're a man in the know? Is there any truth to the Tierney rumblings? Not not from the north. It's quiet. It's quiet there. I think if you know fullback wise, I think that you know I think Matt Target would have signed his extension if he was going to stay on. I think they're looking above Matt Target, and I think they've got their eyes on um, a European fullback. So I, I I don't see that. I think with I think the centre half thing will will unravel in the next couple of days because Botman is a player that Newcastle have set their stall on. And they they've they've chased him, and it's now as I believe down to Milan or Newcastle. So I'm I'm guessing it'll be down to salary or, or money. I don't I don't see either of those two are Arsenal players, and certainly haven't mentioned been mentioned in our circles. Okay, let's get to some fun stuff here. You're listening to uh, Football Frenemies. It's episode number one. Um, we are playing today, Monday the thirteenth of June. Um, Delighted to be on the first one, by the way. <laughs> you are. You are on the <laughs> premiere, uh, by the way. I thought I'd ease in on the football frenemy front because it's not like we hate Newcastle. I think that we're we're going to start getting a bit jealous if you guys, you know, do make moves and uh, and start showing that, you know, money, I mean, start showing it's, money does change teams, doesn't it? Let's be honest. It, it really it, does. It does. It does, yeah. but I, I do want to say something as well for for all your Arsenal fans as well, and and I know I speak from a lot. I think the biggest, the biggest bugbear among Newcastle fans of everyone, and I'm not just aiming this at Arsenal fans. I'm aiming it uh, in the Premier League in general, is that there's this this odyssey that Newcastle fans, you know, they kick above their stay. They want more than they than than, than they should have. They don't. They really, really don't. The fact is, I think what 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 stems from that is because they're so, they, they're so well followed, but they have been they have been in the old second division. You know, I can recall going to Peterborough, on a an away game, and mm-hmm. there was sixteen thousand in London Road, right? Sixteen thousand fans, and fourteen thousand were from Newcastle, and two thousand were the That's home crazy. fans. So, I think it because of the sheer volume of support. They people again an easy narrative for, and this is something that's led by. Uh, all the press that Newcastle fans they they think they should be playing. We don't think we should be playing in Champions League. All we asked for was to see a team that had a bit of effort. And under Steve Bruce, I'm really sorry, that was short of nothing. He he at the finish, so he was clo- he was clueless. He looked clueless. He he didn't want to be on the touchline. He didn't know what was going on. The players were questioning him. The pl- I mean, they were coming in a training at three in the afternoon. He wasn't there. It was a shambles. So forgive us for thinking, you know, that we're excited. I don't think that we think we should be in the Champions League. I think that when Newcastle show effort, uh, a couple of games that, that spring to mind, we got beat uh, on that run at Chelsea, uh, where for a large part of the game, we were the better side and, and we went down to a sickening late goal at Chelsea and against Everton. But you know what? We clapped them off because they gave, they left nothing on the pitch. And I was happy with mm-hmm. that. And that is the majority of Newcastle fans. They're, they're happy if they leave nothing on that pitch. Yeah, I, I would say that if the games that we lost, you know, to Crystal Palace, Brighton and Southampton and Newcastle, if our players had just given more, shown more, yeah. you know, had yeah. a little bit more backbone, it would be different. Uh, but, you know, it's so true in those instances. You just think, wow, we, we've we got the talent, but the truth is beyond our starting 11, you know, we're weak. We're absolute weak source. You know, no Tierney, no Partey, no Tommy Yasu. That changes the dynamics of a team. Now, it shouldn't. I mean, it did for Leicester this season. They were depleted. And you've mm. seen the results of you know, Leicester's, uh, Leicester's season. Um, but in football, there's no excuses as far as I'm concerned when you're a club like the Arsenal and you have the opportunity to, you know, buy or get some resources in January and you failed to do that, um, which is unfortunate. Right, let's get to this. Um, football Frenemies, episode number one here with Geordie Pete Redding. You can follow him here. You see his handle 
on the screen. Which team do you, I don't like using the word hate, but I'm sorry, it's football. Which team do you hate more, Sunderland or Middlesbrough? Sunderland. <laughs> Middlesbrough, I feel sorry for Borough. They haven't got, they haven't got a neighbour that they can hate. So they'll take whoever's closest to them at the time. <laughs> um, Borough, it's, it's not a, they call it, a, it's the, it's the Tyne Tees derby. No, um, you know, Sunderland is, is, is the main game. Um, at all due respect to Borough, um, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're close. But for me, Borough is no different to play in Leeds, Sheffield Wednesday, Barnsley, um, but it's definitely Sunderland. Which team do you think Newcastle fans have a soft spot for, if there is one? It's a good question. Um, I feel like I with can't Arsenal, speak for them all. I, I feel like with Arsenal, most, I think a lot. Oh, well, on our show, with my experience, I think a lot of them were hoping Everton would stay up. Like when it gets to relegation. I think mm. they'd rather see more storied teams, you know, stay up. So they, I think, even though you know Leeds is not a very likable team, it's it's good for the Premier League for them to be in there. Burnley has history, no doubt about that. But in terms of recent competitiveness, I, and, and Watford, I don't think anyone's bothered, you know, that that they're re, that they're relegated. Um, maybe mm. I don't know if we have a soft spot for anyone, but. I think along those lines, um... possibly City because of what they've done, and possibly you were looking mm. at City thinking, you know, and I'm talking now pre takeover, you would go, oh, just to be able to go and watch that, I suppose. And sp- personally speaking, definitely, if there was three or four matches to choose and my team weren't playing, I'd, I'd club for City. So possibly City. Um, was gutted Everton didn't Everton didn't go down. Gutted. <laughs> you can tell Kev. He's gonna be listening to this, so uh <laughs> No, watch this, out. this there's a there's a there's a thing between Newcastle and Everton fans as well. It's funny, isn't it, how how it how it develops. Um and, and a couple of clubs over the last few years, their supporters have done that. And one is Everton uh, with Newcastle and the other's Aston Villa, um, which is which is mad, but it's there. It's there's a there's a sort of a growing discontent between the two sets of supporters. <laughs> Listen, you know what I've just realised, Pete, is that I really should be because I'm not a super merch girl when it comes to, and this stems from the 2006 Champions League final. Mm. You know, I I've really worn my shirt when we play. And someone said to me the other day, well, maybe it's time to take a look at that because it's not like you've been lighting the football world on fire. <sighs> and I just realized I've made a fundamental mistake. Unlike Mikel Arteta, I can admit to my mistakes. Sorry, had to, had to. Low blow, <laughs> I know, guys, very low blow. I should be wearing my Arsenal shirt on Football Frenemies. You've got mm. your... You've got your Newcastle swag behind you. You've got your street sign. You've got your shirt on. I've got the tube sign, but I really need to be wearing my Arsenal gear. You should. You should. And that's uh, the ball behind is a signed Bobby Robson ball as well. So, oh, um, what a legend. Well, well represented in the Northeast. Well represented. Okay, let's get, let's get your take on this too. What do you think is the greatest football rivalry in English football? This is, you know, d- d- divides rooms because he could first off you do. I've spoke to many players that have played. Now, Paul Stewart is a perfect example. Now, Paul Stewart has played in many derbies. He's played in the Merseyside derby. He's played in the North London derby and he's played in the Newcastle and Sunderland derby. And he said for pure hatred, it's Newcastle Sunderland. Uh, obviously, you've got Rangers and Celtic in there, which is more, you know, political as well as as anything else. But he said, and there's quite a few who've said Newcastle Sunderland. Um, I must admit, I look forward to a good North London derby, um, and because that is, you know, the build up to it is is there, and and you can you can you can see it. Um, I'd say I'd say one of those two. Um, and I have I've been to I've been to a Celtic Rangers uh, before, and that I mean that's just off off the off the chart. It's not necessarily a derby, but do you do you think Manchester United Liverpool is yeah. up up there? It was, wasn't it? And now yeah. you look at it, and it doesn't it doesn't it as you've quite rightly said earlier in the show that 
the goings on at Manchester United, does that take away somewhat from it? That that you know, it's you expect Manchester United and Liverpool to be closely four yellow cards, the odd red thrown in, um, you know, golden of the referee. Liverpool just slay them currently, and so it, it tends to lose a little bit of its um, of its yeah. fun and value. I've kind of enjoyed the North London derbies recently, where the media lord Tottenham. And they just in you know just just think we're going to get trounced. And my favourite derby in recent years, there's two: the four-two um, where Torreira takes his shirt off, and of course the three, the three, um, the three-one earlier this season where the Hayland boys just lit the Emirates up. Um, mm. I I, I kind of like I've enjoyed being the underdog only because of the overlording of Tottenham, who've won absolutely nothing and achieved nothing other than having a world-class partnership up front with Kane and Son, you know, so I, I love, I kind of really loved, you know, those matches and it's Mm. always great, isn't it? Hearing uh, super Kev's take on playing in the Merseys Merseyside Derby, playing in the North London Derby. And of course, when he went to Turkey, um, insane (laughs) um, fanaticism (laughs) there, uh, I think he, he turned up for training on his first day and there were 90,000 fans at the training ground. Madness. Um, what's your favourite international uh, rivalry, like football-wise? Again, it, it stems from, from from the past. I love to see South American because uh, yeah. that's just phenomenal on and off the pitch, of course. But, you know, the old they call it the old home uh, championship, but again, that's sort of dispersed, hasn't it? England, Scotland was always. I used to love those games. Pete. Yeah, absolutely, a real sort of you know end of it was an end of season job. Mm-hmm. You knew there was thousands coming down where, from 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 Scotland, and um, and again, they they're just the fervor and passion of could they beat the old enemy? And an enemy was in that. It was called the old enemy. So, I think I think that at a push, it would have to be that. But I love to see Brazil and Argentina play as well. Imagine that as a World Cup final, hey? Brazil, Argentina, perfect. or wouldn't the perfect ending um, be Portugal, Argentina, Messi and Ronaldo in a World Cup final? I to mean, find out who is rights, the gold. Yeah, football <laughs> rights fairy tales. I'll get you out on this one before we get back to Hollywood balls for a second. Mm. Who do you fancy for the World Cup? Uh, I don't, you know... I had this conversation this morning and you, you, you look at England who are third favourites and for a reason, you know, they can they go one step further? I don't know. I, I, I'm just still not, I'm still not 100% happy with Gareth Southgate and I think he's got a long, hard think. I don't think he knows himself what he needs to do up front. Interestingly, I think for the first time in a long time is, is, is problems on up front and in midfield, they're at the back. Um, mm-hmm. He's got to, he's he's got to sort that defence out, but he, and he's got a wealth of, of talent, and we all know it's going to be Harry Kane up front. But who does he surround him with? You know, who's his choices? Uh, is he in the Grealish fan club? Is he not? So England, although they've got a good chance, um, and and again, it's it's the same it's the same names that you look at, and we saw the other night the last two games, Messi seems to have turned up. In an Argentina top, which he's been accused of not doing, I quite, yeah. I've got, I've got a fancy for them. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it's going to be one of those we look back on moments where don't forget special. the temperature. No, the t- <laughs> well, people are saying, no- oh, it's in the winter. People are saying, oh, it's, it's in the winter. Warm. It doesn't matter. It's still, it's still humidity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and I can tell you, it'll, it'll benefit. It'll benefit those sort of teams. I just don't trust England at all. I don't, I think just looking at Southgate's tactics, uh, France, I think will be well up for it. Uh, Argentina, Brazil still have a talented team. Um, You can never rule out Germany, of course. Um, And, you know, Portugal uh, with, with that, they've got talent in that, in that side. I mean, they almost didn't make it, you know, but, but Mm. I think once they're there, they'll be, they'll be well up for it. I've got to say, and I think I'll say it because I'm sure there's many people thinking it. England have got the most exciting group of players they've had for a very long time. A squad, a young squad. And I don't think he knows what to do with it. And I don't think he's got that killer instinct. Kev and I argued about this at the weekend. I said that if Gareth Southgate doesn't win the World Cup, 
he should be judged. Um, yeah. And I believe that. And I think that he doesn't know himself. And of course, he's got these games coming up and he says that's what they're for. But I think this is a massive tournament for him. It's been it's been amazing, you know, getting to the stages they did in the World Cup and, of course, the Euro finals. But he didn't take the handbrake off, you know, too conservative. You could argue as well the route to the World Cup um, phase that we got to was um, not lucky, but didn't really favorable. face. Yeah, very favorable. Um, so, yeah. OK, awesome stuff. Football Frenemies episode number one in the books. Uh Hollywood balls, let everyone know before that. Where do Newcastle finish next season? Seventh. Seventh. So below Arsenal. <laughs> I think so. I do. I think so. I think, I definitely think so. Um, but they'll knock them out in the cup. Oh, here we go. All right. I like it. I like it. I don't like it, but I can see it. Um, <laughs> let everyone know a little bit more uh, where they can mm. find you and Kev and this show and all of that. Okay. So Hollywood Balls Live is our own platform now, and you can find it on live.hollywoodballs.live. Uh, and of course, there's a link to it on my on my Twitter handle as well. This is our own platform, but it's it's new in the fact that people can join in the uh, the stream now, Sophie. They get they can they can join live if they've got an opinion. They can put their hand up, and we can buzz them in. And this is the first um, the first of its kind. So yeah, you know we've got the comments and and the private chat areas, of course. But if people really disagree with me and Super Kev, they can. There's a little hand at the bottom of of the screen on on Hollywood Balls. They can click that, and we can we can let them in real time, and they can come on and give us hell if they want. That's wicked, awesome. Sounds and absolutely also, brilliant. You know, we've got a bit. We've got a social commerce platform to it as well. So you know, people who who are in merch can can sell their 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 product during the show while the show's on. I think we were finding that with sponsorships that people, you, you would get a drop in the audience when you were giving them their offers because they would have to log off and go and look at the said site for their offers. So we were losing, um, we were losing audience time, but now with that, um, and just having the fans engaged, we, we've had three episodes now where the fans can come in live and they love it. I mean, it's, but Kev's warned them. Kev's got a red card and a yellow card. And if they if they don't if they don't get to the point straight away, they're off. It's a straight red. Um yeah. so uh, well, we've yeah, we've been doing fun. that all we've been doing that all season. And trust me, it, it works. Definitely keeps them <laughs> in check, that's for sure. Well, barring a couple. Um so go over to Dubai underscore Geordie, check out Hollywood Balls Live. All the links are on his uh Twitter profile. Uh it's been absolutely brilliant starting off. You know, with uh, with you on the football frenemies uh, series, um, love it. Newcastle United. You know, we don't exactly hate you, but I think we're going to grow to really hate you in the coming years. Uh, hopefully, you will not win anything next season. <laughs> Bring it on! Sorry, Pete. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Um, brilliant stuff. Thanks for joining me. Uh, you guys will be back for episode two um, very soon. You'll love this one. The next Football Frenemies episode is with a Manchester United fella. And he's been on this show before. Look out for the community page and the announcement on Twitter. That's going to be an interesting one. I think less friendlier than this one. That's for sure. Pete, thanks again. Uh, take care Pleasure. and we'll see you next time, everybody. <laughs> Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. <laughs>